Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone, and hello to everyone watching on the stream. My name is Jeremiah Harmson. I am an engineer here in Zurich. I lead our applied machine intelligence team. Our general mission is to advance the impact of machine learning here in Zurich, across Google, and throughout the world. So why are we here in Zurich? I want to take a few minutes to talk about why Zurich is the hub of AI research for Google in Europe. So the Zurich office is actually one of our oldest offices in Europe. It's one of our largest engineering offices. It's the largest one outside the States. And similarly, our research center here is the largest one outside the States. And those two really play off each other, right? So the product teams, they have all these really interesting challenges to solve. And the research teams work hand in hand with them to solve them. So as a researcher, this is fantastic, right? We get to build all these things and immediately impact billions of lives, whether it's through Chrome or Gmail or YouTube. So this is a really natural place to do that. Uh, we've got a lot of great universities with ETH and EPFL. We have a number of um, programs where we support and work <laughs> with researchers there. Um, we also have a growing fundamental research group here. We have a brain team that is growing very quickly. They look at things like re reinforcement learning, uh, artificial neural networks in general, optimization, and some adversarial networks. So really quickly, I want to highlight some of the work that the teams across Google do in research. The first is the handwriting team. So this team takes a bunch of squiggles across a bunch of different services and turns them into words, right? whether it's on a watch or, or on your phone. This team uses this technology to build a really neat web app called QuickDraw. Has anyone used QuickDraw before? All right, a few folks. I think I found the, the Googlers. Um, I, I, I highly recommend trying this out. This is a lot of fun. This is where you get to draw. And the machine tries to guess what you're drawing, whether it's a helicopter or an ice cream cone. So this has been a lot of fun. But it's also been a really interesting source of doodles. We've gotten over a billion doodles from 100 different countries. And we've released this as a data set, which is really interesting for people, for researchers at Google and outside Google to comb through. So, so for instance, here is, uh, okay. so for instance, here's what a chair looks like as drawn by different countries, right? And it's interesting because you can see some countries in general draw it a little bit differently. So, you know, this might come up a little bit later as we talk about biases in data, right? For instance, we can see some countries may prefer a little bit of an ISO view or things like that. And so what happens if we leave them out of our training data? And what happens when we try to classify a chair that's maybe drawn from one of these places where we don't have as much data. All right, another really great product is from the Sense team here. This team is really at the forefront of putting machine learning on device. Uh, this one in particular is called Now Playing. This sort of gives you an ambient superpower where you always know what song is playing. This runs in the background. And this is a really challenging problem, right? Because we don't want to suck everyone's battery down. It also has some really interesting privacy implications. This model runs completely on device. It doesn't send any data to Google. So I think this is a really interesting direction we're going to see a lot more of. So from the same team is one of my favorite uses of machine learning. So this is um, smart text selection. I'm sure everybody's tried to select text on their phone. You have this frustrating experience of trying to drop the two little blue pins with your thumbs. Um, I have kind of big thumbs. It's especially awkward for me. This is actually a machine learning model that runs on the device. So when you touch a piece of text, it does a search to figure out what you're touching. Right? If you touch a phone number, it automatically selects it for you. If you touch an address, it automatically selects the address for you. And again, this is a model that runs on device. It doesn't need to send data to Google. And I think this is a great example of improving one of those little frustrations for users. All right, the last thing I'll mention is that we work on the tools that are open source. Um, I really wanted to put a slide of what we're working on. Unfortunately, it hasn't been released. So I encourage everyone to watch the TensorFlow Developer Summit a week from Friday. Um, the team from Zurich will be there and announcing what we've been working on for the last, for the last year. 
All right, that was a very quick tour. Um, I am excited that everyone is here in Zurich, and I'm excited to hear the speakers. So with that, I'd like to move on to Fernanda and Jess. Thank you, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm so excited. This is the first pair UX symposium. As um, Matt and Lucio were saying before, we had the first symposium last year and it was a general symposium. This is the first focused symposium around UX. And I think that matters a lot because if we wanna think seriously about AI uh, and how it affects people's lives and how users interact with AI, we need to be thinking from a user experience perspective. And so that's why today is, is really important. Um, so I'm Fernanda Villegas. Does this one work? Oh, hey, hey I'm Jess Holbrook. So, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, about Pear. Um, so uh, Jess and I and Martin Wattenberg, who could, couldn't be here today, launched Pear um, last year, middle of last year. And this was really the first time there was an initiative um, at Google for people plus AI research. Um, and again, trying to bring these different perspectives to the table. So design thinking, HCI, how do we build ML systems that um, are designed with user needs um, in mind from the beginning, from the very objective function that, that you design? How do you design an objective function that takes into account user needs? Um, so when we talk about people plus AI research, who are the people? That's a question we get a lot. So who are the people you're talking about? We're talking about a range of people. We're talking about uh, hardcore machine learning researchers and engineers. What are the tools that they need to develop better machine learning systems? Um, if you've been programming for a while, you probably know that traditional development tools are not exactly designed for machine learning. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this. So what kind of tooling do we need? Um, and then a different kind of user is kind of the, the user in the middle here where we talk about augmented expert intelligence. So imagine professionals who are going to be interacting with machine learning enabled systems at a professional level, at an expert level, but they are not themselves machine learning experts, right? So you can think about doctors, designers, architects, musicians. How do you actually partner with an intelligent system um, in a meaningful, productive way? So these are some of the things we're studying um, in pair. And then finally, all the way to the right here, this notion of AI for everyone. So even if you are a, a, a lay user, you are potentially, so imagine a situation, you were a YouTube viewer and you were being recommended the next uh, video for you to watch. Maybe there's something where you want an explanation about why you were recommended a video. Those kinds of, of questions about um, explainability, trust, um, how do we surface some of what the machine learning systems are doing in the back end for users are also research questions we're looking into. There's a whole host of research questions that I think permeate all of this that have to do with fairness also um, that we're looking into. So when we talk about people plus AI, it's a whole range of people and users we have in mind. And so finally, what does PAIR do? We've been very busy. We do a lot of different kinds of things. So one, one of the things I'm very excited about is the first column here on the left where we get to open source tools uh, and platforms. And so this is the place where we take a lot of the things that we're actually doing at Google, tools that we're using internally at Google that are very helpful and we externalize them, we open source them and that makes me very happy. Um, and so I'm very quickly gonna talk about that. Um, we also create educational materials, uh, and these are for the lay user. These are not for experts. Um, we public in, in, we have academic pu publications. We are sharing uh, best practices. We run symposia. We have visiting faculty. We, ha we give out uh, faculty grants. So there's a whole host of ways in which we interact with the broader community around this notion of human AI interaction. 
And then, as I was saying, one of the things that gives me, gives me great joy is that we get to open source tools like Facets. Uh, so Facets is a visualization that allows you to look at your training data. Again, one of those gaps in uh, machine learning tooling. Your data is super important. How do you look at it? How do you debug your data, right? And so tools like Facets allow you to do that in a much more effective way. Um, and it's been really great to see how Facets gets used by people outside of Google. So for instance, um, this woman, Joy Bolamini from the MIT Media Lab used facets on the on her research in her research to look into uh, fairness and and how different facial recognition apis deal with uh, different races for instance and different genders um, and so again it's great to see how these tools make it out there and how they're being used uh, for very serious um, research work um, another uh, focus of research for us is just uh, fairness. Uh, and we've done, a, we've done a, a number of things here. So released tools, so this is facets that you saw, the one that's animating here is called the embedding projector, which allows you to visualize massively high dimensional spaces, which is super useful in machine learning. Um, we've also worked with creative labs to um, uh, create uh, an introductory video on what is machine bias, what, what is bias in machine learning. Um, there are obviously publications. Th this one here, I'm very excited so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. This one here, can you see my cursor? Okay, great. So this one here was, was uh, kind of different. We actually kind of translated a highly mathematical um, paper around definitions of machine learning fairness into a visualization that people could play with, a simulation around um, a bank giving out loans for different kinds of populations, okay? And one of the things that was really interesting was to talk about the fact that there are different definitions of fairness and you need to choose a definition of fairness to implement in your system. Unfortunately, mathematically speaking, you can't put all the definitions of fairness together in one system. So you're always going to have to choose, how are you going to be fair, right? And so the reason why I call this out is that um, it was a simple visualization, uh, a simple simulation, and it went viral. And part of the reason was that it created this much more accessible way of turning this ma these mathematical equations into something that people could play with and could understand and could start to see the trade-offs. And so we got a lot of emails from you know places like criminal justice uh, systems in the US asking us, oh, could I create a visualization like this to try to understand fairness within my own context? Um, and so again, I think it speaks to the need of having ways of broadening the message and, and, and uh, involving other stakeholders into this bigger debate of what it means to have these machine learning systems um, and how they interact with society as a whole. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out very quickly is um, we're also, uh, we also launched DeepLearn.js, which is this really exciting, um, machine learning open source library that brings ML to the web. And that matters. Why? Because it means it lowers the barriers. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to install anything. It's, it's JavaScript based. So it means it opens up machine learning to a whole new host of, of developers. It runs on your browser. It runs on your phone. It runs locally. You're not sending you're not sending information anywhere else to any one service. So it, it just it's been great to see how people have been using it. So Alex Chen, who is going to speak later today, is going to talk about Teachable Machine that used DeepLearn.js. Um, another group in Brain, Magenta, used it to create music online to let you partner with this machine learning enabled jamming session uh, called Performance RNN. Um, 
we have people here in the house who, um, so we have Dan Schiffman, who are, who are you, where, where are you? Dan, Dan, okay, go talk to Dan afterwards. So Dan is, is um, a faculty member uh, at, at NYU and is working, um, is, is creating this entire GitHub repository called ML5.js which is basically the friendly machine learning for the web uh, that you see here. This is Dan's work and his students' work. And so the idea, again, is to use these something like DeepLearn.js to broaden the reach of machine learning, just in, in the sense to, to bring folks who may not have been able to work with these systems outside of places like Google or academic, other academic institutions that are very computer science centric. But how do you broaden it? How do you bring it to a much bigger um, audience? So Dan Schiffman is doing this work. Um, there is also a, a whole undergrad um, class going on right now at MIT that, that uses DeepLearn.js so that students can just start building as soon as possible with machine learning. And I'm gonna stop here. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to expand on, on what Fernando was saying there. One of the things that really gets me excited about PEAR and about the field in general right now is this idea of expanding the conversation and expanding who's included in the work that we're doing here um, and, and seeing how this is starting to manifest. So one of the stories is, uh, I think it was like two or three weeks ago, um, these tweets, uh, this guy named Oz started tweeting uh, about deep learning, about how he was learning uh, deep learning JS. Um, to, uh, you know, the problem that he wanted to solve was that he wanted to build, he wanted to help his friend who had had a stroke and is paralyzed be able to navigate the web. And so how he was doing it is he was trying to build a Chrome extension using uh, DeepLearn.js to allow his friend to navigate the web uh, with his eyes. Uh, there's a link here. You know, let's click it because it's pretty cool if you see it. Um, and we started forwarding this around on our team uh, Alex uh, also reached out to Oz. Um, I think one of the more interesting parts of Oz's story is uh, Oz is uh, homeless. So he's a homeless veteran in Portland uh, who uh, sleeps in a homeless shelter at night and he goes to the library and he codes on deep learn during the day because he wants to uh, allow people with physical disabilities like his friend uh, access to the web. Um, last week, uh, called Oz, kind of talked to him about what he wants to get done. We're looking at ways we can partner with him. Um, I've actually kind of randomly been thinking about Oz these last couple of days as I'm kind of, it's not lost on me that, you know, I'm like traveling halfway around the world for a conference in Zurich, uh, you know, in the room that we're in now. And Oz is, you know, it's, it's nighttime uh, on the West Coast right now. So like Oz is sleeping in a homeless shelter right now, but he's gonna wake up and contribute and try to make the world a better place in the way that he wants to with some of the things that we're building right here. And this is really, really inspiring to me, right? Like I, th I think we're kind of getting at this inclusion and people being able to solve their own problems with AI uh, from many different angles. Uh, so this is like just pretty amazing uh, kind of stuff to see. And I'd recommend everyone follow him because he's a guy on a mission. Uh, and, and so I think there's gonna be a lot of, a lot more to come from Oz. Um, Another thing that we've been working on for the last 18 months or so is something that we call AIY projects. So this is something that, that I was a project I was on until December. Um, and this is really about bringing uh, AI to the maker and probably gonna extend into the STEM uh, communities. So these are like the little, if you haven't seen these before, remember the little uh, cardboard VR goggles we did like a couple years ago. It's kind of like that, but for like AI in a bunch of different ways. Uh, these little kits, if you already have a Raspberry Pi, are, are pretty cheap. They're like 20 bucks. I think the Vision kit's like 45. And so we have two, one that really focuses on audio, so audio input and output, and one that is a camera, so it focuses on recognition. One of the really cool things about the camera is it does it all on device, so all the models run on device. Um, this is something that's come up a, a couple times, so I wouldn't mind, I wanted to just kind of put a little extra emphasis on it, especially for the people that aren't from Google, is that we're investing a lot, and you'll hear a lot about everything running on device, not sending anything to the cloud, not making that a requirement for people to get the benefits of AI. Um, I don't have it here, but one of the tweets from our original launch that really inspired me was this dad posted a tweet with his kid and he said, uh, just did our first electronics project together. 
and they built our kit. And what blew my mind is like that kid's orientation towards what an electronics project is, is that it has AI in it. Like, like the first thing he put together, he was building and controlling and using AI to do what he wanted it to do. Like that's a mind blowing generational shift um, that I hope that we can actually put a lot more pressure on and that people don't feel an intimidation or, or an otherness or like, oh, I, I'm, I'm worried about this thing, but like helping them control it from like nine years on, nine, year, nine years old and on, um, I think is, is a big shift in the mindset that we can make. Um, <clears throat> we also reach uh, very fancy people. Um, so this is Martin uh, testifying before uh, the House of Commons on the Science and Technology Committee. Uh, where he broke out his best suit and tie. Uh, and so, you know, actually talking to people about algorithmic decision making and, and helping to try to inform a lot of these very big and very important policy debates, uh, you know, through uh, people that are on the ground trying to make this work so, so we have the right uh, policies uh, around the world. Um, and then we're also doing a ton to try to reach uh, as much of the UX community as we can. So uh, just a little while ago, um, through a lot of effort of uh, Josh Lovejoy and others, uh, we launched a Google Design collection, really focused on pair and what we call the UX of AI. Um, so we're trying to get as many of our resources up and, and out here. Uh, we, we don't really talk about unreleased stuff or, or stuff we do internally, but this kind of came out of uh, a lot of internal efforts that we've done around trying to educate and mobilize the UX community uh, at Google to really own what is the, e the UX of AI and what is this kind of next next wave of user experience we want to create. And so we're trying as rapidly as we can to get as much of this external as well because we it's a thing that's a lot bigger than Google and a lot bigger uh, than a small group at Google for sure. Um, and so with that, I, I kind of, I've been thinking about this, like how how to kind of put a wrapper on you know, what, what Fernanda and I get the question a lot of times, like, what is PEAR doing? Or like, why does PEAR exist? Or, or what is our, what is our, our, our purpose here? And, and one of the ways I kind of, I put it sometimes is, you know, I think we're making human-centered AI the easiest option. And I think that there's kind of two big parts there. Like, I think one of the big parts is we're trying to define what human-centered AI is, right? We're trying to define that through a big conversation with a lot of people and a lot of different groups and companies and, and, and technologists and academics and everything like that. And so we're truly trying to define what we think that means with all these with all these improvements. And then as a user researcher, I'm a big believer in people do the easier thing, the easiest thing, not the thing they're most motivated to do. So I'm looking for way, we're looking for ways of like, how do we make that human centered approach to AI the easiest option? How do we put tools and resources and trainings and options and everything in people's hands? So that if they are on board with us and they want to do this human-centered AI thing, that it's the easiest option for them to do it. And with that, I think we're going to really, you know, push that into the conversation and into the world through products um, that we build. And with that, I think it's time to move on uh, to the pretty great uh, uh, speaker lineup we have. This is our hashtag, if you care to tweet. Um, I think that's it. All right, let's get going.